What were God's instructions concerning the vows of a married woman? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Numbers on walking through the Bible. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Numbers chapter 30. We're going to be reading from verses 9 to 16. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So, Numbers chapter 30, beginning of verse 9. Also, any vow of a widow or divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. If she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath, and her husband heard it and made no response to her and did not overrule her, then all her vow shall stand, and every agreement by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband truly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatever proceeded from her lips concerning her vows or concerning the agreement binding her, it shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord will release her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict her soul, her husband may confirm it, or her husband may make it void. Now, if her husband makes no response, whatever to her from the day from day to day, then he confirms all her vows, or all the agreements that bind her. He confirms them because he made no response to her on the day that he heard them. But if he does make them void after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, and between a father and his daughter in her youth, in her father's house. In this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion on vows, specifically the vow of a woman. In the last lesson, we looked at the vows of a woman made while living in her father's house, and vows made before she was married, but then later got married. In both cases, either the father, in the former case, or the husband, in the latter case, had the option of objecting to the vow and releasing the woman from its terms. He could only do this on the day he heard the vow. If he agreed or kept silent, then the vow stood, and like all other vows, it must be performed. Why did God give a woman's father or husband the right to do this? Because God placed the father as the head of the family, and thus he placed the husband as the head of the family. Therefore, he could object to the vows of those under his authority due to the fact that those vows would likely concern him in some way as well. It is not that God viewed women as less than in society, but he did place the man in authority in certain situations, and therefore all those under his authority were to submit to his authority. This statement is seen as controversial today only because our society has moved farther and farther away from God, and the consequences of this are being clearly seen in the collapse of the family as God designed it and all the problems associated with that. Just because God placed man in authority over the family, do, does this mean the woman had no say? No, for a wise husband will seek out her advice as the husband and the wife are to be one. But as the head, it does mean that unless the husband is asking the wife to sin, she is to submit to the decisions that are being made. What if the husband makes poor decisions? God will judge him for that. What if the wife doesn't submit? God will judge her for that. In all things, though, children of God are to obey God in all areas of their lives. Coming now to verse 9, we quickly have instructions of vows made by widows or women who are divorced. In those two instances, the woman is not under the authority of her husband, for he is either dead or no longer her husband in the eyes of man, nor is she under the authority of her father, for she left her father's house in order to marry. As such, her vows were to be carried out, for there was nobody to overrule them. If the woman remarried, the instructions given in verses 6 to 8 would apply. In verses 10 to 15, we come to the final exception for the keeping of vows, and that concerned vows made by a woman while she was married. And just like the other two exceptions, the one who has authority over her may object, in this case her husband, and his objection would release her from the vow. The objection must be raised as soon as he heard it. If he agreed with the vow, or if he remained silent, the terms of the vow would stand and must be performed. What if the husband later tried to annul the vow, or in essence annulled the vow by refusing to let his wife perform it? He would bear her guilt, according to verse 15, seeing as how he was preventing her from fulfilling what was her duty to do. 
God does not hold us accountable for the sins of others. He only holds us accountable for our own sins. Now, I don't believe that the woman was released from her vow in this situation, but she was being prevented from performing it through the actions and sin of her husband. That meant that if her husband later repented of his sin, she would then need to perform her vow. I cannot be completely certain of this conclusion, but from the context, the conclusion seems reasonable. However, since we're not under this law today, we don't have to worry about this. We simply must follow what God has told us to do. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Numbers chapter 31, verses 1 to 11, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.